my name is Lance from Transition Bondi and we're here in Enmore at Michelle Margolis's house and she's going to show us some of the amazing things she's done with her urban space for her permaculture garden. Let's go. Come on Elvis. <laughs> Hi I'm Michelle Margolis and I'd like to welcome everybody here who's come to visit the garden. We've got Pete from Transition Bondi and various other people from Transition Bondi and People, wonderful garden growers from nearby and uh, wonderful permaculture people from various places and uh, farmer, um, masser, um, grafter, whatever else who doesn't want to be on camera from Adelaide. Maybe he doesn't want to be on camera. <laughs> um, and yeah, other people who come to visit, everybody's welcome and I will enjoy showing everyone around. All right, so um, this was a neat and tidy cottage garden in 1988 when I moved in with a lawn and a hedge and not much else happening um, and of course it had the verge lawn there and so people had to keep mowing it and putting sprays on and so on and now I think there are about 50 fruit trees in this garden and about seven or eight raised beds but you can keep track because my maths isn't as good as my gardening. <laughs> okay, so I'll just point out the fruit trees and if you want to ask anything about anything else feel free. Um, there's probably lots coming up that I didn't plant and that's a good sign of a healthy garden because I don't want to be such a control freak. I control everything that comes up. Um, the weeds. <laughs> the weeds are medicinal herbs. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a little lunchbox banana that came from Leonie McNamara. Um, she lives in Woolga Avenue, Dulwich Hill, and they won the Best Sustainable Streets Award in Australia and I think they got free solar. So we've had a little bit of trade going on. Leonie and I worked together on, for TAFE at Outreach doing urban food growing. Yeah, so a uh, lunchbox banana there that won't get very big and I think considering I'm struggling with four-year-old trees, I think I'm going to go dwarf fruit trees from now on. Even if I was six foot tall, it's, it gets a bit unmanageable harvesting. Uh, mandarin that got moved and is surviving. Um, this is a Japoti Kaba, which is a subtropical fruit tree. Um, which grows in Sydney. A lot of subtropical fruit trees grow in Sydney. So people think you can't grow mangoes and bananas, but you can grow a lot of subtropical fruit here. Uh, there's some turmeric coming up here. That's been quite successful. Ginger, garlic, turmeric, luxury crops we usually get from China and Mexico that are sprayed with pesticide. We can grow them in Sydney. And coffee, we can grow our luxury crops here. We don't need to get slaves to grow them for us. Um, this is a cafe lime, which is great in Thai cooking. So I haven't bought herbs or spices. Well, I have bought spices, but I haven't bought herbs for years. And increasingly think, well, I don't need to buy spices either. I've got a cupboard load of them because I'm a cook, but I don't actually need them. Um, I have maybe three pawpaws, but I'm hoping to just have all of this front garden pawpaws because they're really successful. Um, there's, an, there's another little pawpaw here. And these are all gifts. Once you get to know people into gardening, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you get you trade and people bring you stuff and you share stuff. It's just a whole community. Uh, another miracle moment. Pontus, Pontus moment. <laughs> it's good they're still in business, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so this is a Cape Gooseberry and so far they haven't been very delicious. I don't know how it got there, um, I have no idea. Um, perennial basil sort of grows everywhere in Sydney. If you see it, it's normally a Greek family and you can just break off, um, you break that off and you give it to someone to take home and they put it in water and you can grow, okay, you pass it on. <laughs> yeah, well anybody it's can have doing it. Fantastic. The more you break right. it off, the better it grows. Um, and it comes back all the time, you don't have to keep replanting it. So somewhere in there is an apple tree from Moss Vale, from Jewel Cochrane. She came and brought me three dwarf apple trees, and I don't really have space, but they've gone in anyway. And over there's a little miniature Washington Naval Orange. So I'll be interested to see how that goes. It goes a lot better with Andrew here, because he picks off all the stink bugs. He's, um, he finds all those little critters, the good ones and the bad ones, <laughs> and notices things. So the observe and interact factor, which sometimes I'm too in a rush to do. Um, this verge was put in a year ago and replaced the lawn. The chickens got the lawn, 
They had their own front lawn, but then they ate it. They didn't appreciate it to look at aesthetically, but they did appreciate the food value. Um, and this has contained probably thousands of dollars worth of herbs, and it's also a little verge school for passing people. Children love it, and I, I usually leave little things in there, and they can decide if they want to take them or not. They have to kind of think, oh, am I allowed to have it? Mm, can I take it? So I call it verge school. <laughs> it's a little ethics school. What are those pink little, um, I don't know, real close yeah, they're, they're snapdragons, um, and they're just, they're just good for attracting bees. And if you take them home and sprinkle them, you'll have a, there's about a hundred and something oh, wow. seeds yeah. in there. So just shake it out in the soil, and you've got snapdragon. Hopefully, let me know if you have snapdragons or not. So it used to be all edible, but I'm trying to do more beautiful things um, because it also attracts bees. You can have flowers that are edible. Anyway, that's my contribution to green energy. <laughs> This is a really beautiful imperial mandarin, very small and very sweet and amazing it fruited it all. If you see this front garden, and, uh, wait a moment. <laughs> oh, here come my friends. The major issue for this part of the garden are these red ironbark trees and they're native trees and, and people tend to think native is good. Um, and they are beautiful in their habitat, but what they're, they're, they're very close to the house. They drop large branches and they're taking up a whole lot of the water and the moisture from the soil, which is why... Hi Eva. Hi Bill. Um, yeah, so the root system, if you imagine, is as tall as the tree at least. It's going to be taking all this moisture. So native trees are fantastic, but that isn't really the right zoning for red ironbark um, and possibly one day you'll read about a death at Browns Avenue because it's fallen on the house and killed me. Um, in which case, what I'm saying now might ring a bell. Because <laughs> they're not really safe trees to have right near houses, apart from which they're just robbing all the moisture. So what we've done over the years is build up the soil layer. So whenever a tree gets chopped down and mulched, I say, hey, where are you taking that stuff? Leave it there. Hey, Darcy, I call my son and after he's taken off on his bike, We've built it up maybe a metre, so that's, that's provided a lot of moisture, which is really good. And this is kind of herb, this is my sleep garden, there's valerian, I haven't used it yet. And there's some chamomile in there and just various herbs, but I kind of thought, I buy tablets to help me sleep, why not just plant a sleep garden? So we'll see how that goes. This is valerian. Yeah, yeah, this is valerian and I, you eat the root, but I kind of feel like if you take the root then you're going to kill the plant, so haven't done it yet. Uh, curry plant, you can make cuttings from that, it smells amazing. Chuck it in a curry, if you, some of you might know it. I'll do that. Smells amazing, smell it. Yeah, can't smell. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Smellarama media. <laughs> um, fig tree in there that, was, that survived, it's a cutting from its mother that was miserable in the back because it's too humid, so that went back to Victoria and this one stayed. This one is really exciting. This is um, Bunchosia or peanut butterfruit. And it's called peanut butterfruit because the fruits taste like a cross between peanut butter and jam. They're really amazing. So come here in wow. spring or I think spring or autumn. I'll let you know. I'll put it out on Facebook and come and eat them. They look like orange dates. So every one of those flowers will be a fruit. So it's going to have a big crop. I really recommend this for community gardens in Sydney if you've got enough moisture and enough mulch. What else is happening? Garlic chives, they're really great to grow in broccoli boxes, which are not really beautiful, but if we use them to plant seeds, then we're saving them from landfill. Um, I've had these chives for about two years. I do nothing with them, and there's always enough to put on soup. Um, and here's some asthma weed, which has a very bad reputation, but it's actually edible. And Greek people put it in spinach pie and make tea with it. Um, some people are allergic to it. Clearly, I'm not. And here it hasn't been sprayed. I wouldn't eat this stuff off the roadside. It's not that nice. I wouldn't deliberately grow it, but it comes up.
Um, pineapple sage, which smells amazing and is great for tea. So you have a smell. And you can eat the flowers. They're really beautiful in salad. They're so sweet. I'll give some to the camera person. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where's the rest of the gang? Wow! Are they coming? Yeah, so coffee. Um, you can eat you can eat these. These are these coffee cherries are edible. I don't really like them, but if you want to try one, feel free. Mm -hmm. um, sure, let's try one. That maybe try choose a red or a one. Really red one. Really red one. Um, you can spit out the pip and we'll rest. Yeah, it. keep the pip. Don't don't waste uh -huh. them. So, a bit later you can have a go at processing coffee from harvesting, pipping, uh, washing, drying, and roasting, and then you can see the end product. Should take about ten minutes. <laughs> well, if, if we minutes. if you do it in, in <laughs> very <laughs> active teams, <laughs> small okay, quantity only. Yeah. So yeah, Thank you. there was um, a barista here and she kept eating them and she wanted to make jam with them. So. Are they <laughs> caffeinated as well, the fruit or just have ten and tell me <laughs> if they are. I don't know. <laughs> Try forty three beans. Yeah, have forty three beans. Um, yeah, they yeah. they keep cropping. They don't crop all in one go. So we've just picked two trees, which is about two kilos. And um, the first two trees have been picked, and they're already flowering again. These were green, and now they're red. So it just seems like we're going to be picking coffee half the year. Um, so far, I've got about two kilos. Um, it's quite a lot of work. You need a lot of DVDs. I recommend first and second series Doctor Who. Is that good? Down here you can see that um, the remnants of my tropical rainforest, I, I got some little tiny palms from Bunnings or somewhere or Kmart, they're really cute little trees without knowing anything about how big they grew and planted them between our houses and of course the, they grew massive and the big fronds kept crashing on my neighbour's roof and I wasn't very popular and it was really not an appropriate thing to plant and not edible. These coffee trees are quite happy in semi-shade. Um, you can see they're looking really wonderful and they're also providing a screen and ongoing luxury crop too, which makes you appreciate the work that's involved, which we'll do that a bit later. I think it's worth going through that process to know something we take for granted so much uh, in our coffee culture. You can see this little semi-shady area is a perfect environment for micro-reptilians. They're really happy here. <laughs> you can see that they're, they're walking but they're not in a great rush to get away to a new environment. They're not looking forward to climate change and I think they've found a niche spot here with the aloe vera. Um, this is an area near it, the rainwater which I, I usually put little seedlings that need care. I find if I leave my seedlings somewhere far from the taps in the house, I forget about them and they die. So I've learnt my lesson. I've put the coffee seedlings under the coffee tree and I've got some locust and pawpaw seedlings near the tap, which reminds me to water them. So that's part of the permaculture system is zoning and putting things in the right place. So if you have things far away from the house, you're a lot less likely to look after them. And another nursery here for seedlings. Uh, a lot of these seedlings go to community gardens and when we have a fundraiser we use them to raise money for earthquakes or whatever. These are all from Jane Mowbray who with, with me and one other person started Inner West Seed Savers and she grows a lot of things and makes loads of cuttings and it just makes sense. One of these plants you can have 10, 20 cuttings and then you can sell them and people can enjoy them, you can share them, give them as gifts. I babysat my sister's pot plants one day and she had one of these in a pot and I thought that's very cute. Now there's just thousands of them all over the garden. And it's called Jewels of Opar. Um, apparently you can eat the leaves, but I rather grow stuff I like eating. You eat the leaves? Try one uh, see what happens. I think you're supposed to cook it. What do you reckon? Is it nice? <laughs> <laughs> He's really good because he eats stuff to see Taste if it's poisonous. Lettuce. Yeah. You Taste lettuce. It's edible and it's quite attractive. So. Here's a spin bin that you can see at the moment you can't spin <laughs> because we put the clothesline down to fit everybody. And this is really good to keep the rats out. A lot of people, there's been a bit of a Facebook discussion about urban composting and rats. Um, so this is good for keeping rats out. So 
it just one thing that we can all think about in the city is that we live like this is near Newtown and there must be thousands and thousands of kilos of organic and non-organic food waste being thrown out and going to landfill um, and really we, we should get together and organise some community composting on a large scale. It's been done in many places and I think, I don't have the skills but I reckon between us we could get that happening and then we won't have to keep buying it and just have it as a community resource. What? A big, butterfly. big butterfly. Well, well yeah there's Quite a lot of diversity in this garden. That, that's possibly, um, Andrew found a pupa on my mandarin tree. There it is. And I was supposed to look after it and watch for when it hatched, but then I forgot where it was. So Andrew went away and came back and said, where's the pupa? I said, I've got no idea. But anyway, it, maybe that was it. <laughs> and it hatched. So now I'm doing a, a high level, broad introduction <laughs> to how this garden was designed. I had some help from a permaculture designer, so, um, credit him for that. Um, the fruit trees have been placed around the periphery and keeping in mind where is north etc um, the deciduous trees are supposed to be there and the perennials are supposed to be here so that you can keep your winter sun. I didn't know that when I planted that mango tree but uh, because of climate change maybe that's not such a bad thing it does provide shade. We've got bees over there um, where it's reasonably cool that they're um, in an old-fashioned system that's going to be replaced with a natural beekeeping system. And their flight path sort of goes over the house. Um, it's probably the best position for them at this stage. We've also got native bees higher up between the two avocados. They're trigona and they're really great for pollinating. Um, so we've got both systems operating. Chickens at the back, um, which means that their manure, when it, when it rains, the sort of nutrients flow downhill. Uh, which is good. The access is a little bit difficult, but it's probably the best place for them. It does get quite hot there. We've had to sort of work out ways to keep them cool in summer so they don't cook. Um, and the rest of the garden is mostly raised beds and vegetables. I just try to pack in as much food as possible. Um, and I always think there's space for more. Um, lots of people would probably space things a little bit more than I do, but I don't do that. Bananas have probably been the most successful thing here. Um, I had three, but because they've been so happy, I figure, well, why not have five and see what happens? <laughs> why not be greedy? <laughs> they do require a bit of maintenance. Um, so this one, Andrew, Andrew, catch. Um, this is mother tree and mother tree bears fruit and you only allow one daughter to come up. You keep one that you know, maybe you like the look of it, you like the position, not too close to the mother. And all these others that come up, they're suckers, you cut them down to the ground. Um, if you don't do that, you'll have a lot of plants and you won't get any fruit because all the energy is going into making babies. Hi Gordon. Hi. This is Gordon, everybody. Hi. Um, so this is the first year I'm going to trial five and see what happens. Um, if it goes well, great. If not, we can cut them down. These can be harvested, dug up and given away or sold. Apparently there's a bit of a disease threat with some banana plants. So um, I think these have been really healthy. If they were sick, then they wouldn't produce good fruit. But I have been told that it's possibly illegal. Now these are ladies' fingers and I thought the trees would be quite small, but they're actually really big. So I think the way to go would be to find dwarf trees because these are pretty hard to manage. My son has to do these, which means hacking them down and chopping them up. It's quite a lot of work. They tend to go up to the chickens when they're chopped up. But you have to be careful because we had a banana mountain and the chickens climbed the banana mountain and then jumped over and ended up at Newington College and they... <laughs> I don't, don't think they were really welcome there. Um, this is... I think this is daikon or ground cucumber and potatoes and there's a Brazilian cherry tree in there, an acerola cherry mm. hidden in there somewhere. So, um, hmm? uh, I try to grow as much garlic as possible because that's a really expensive thing to buy. So leafy greens um, and luxury crops, I think they're the things I concentrate on. I don't grow a lot of potatoes because they're cheap and I haven't got much space so it's just important to grow what you eat and you know work out 
what's going to be what's going to pay the best. Garlic's good in that it doesn't take much space, but it takes ages and ages and ages to be ready. So you have to weigh that up. Um, and also, if the weather's really damp and moist like it has been, maybe I've lost a whole lot of it. I had a lot more, and it's probably underground somewhere. But I haven't bought garlic for about four years, and that's pretty good. <laughs> these are um, these are from Seed Savers in Victoria, um, and we're trying as hard as possible to grow heritage and save seed. So these look like they've survived fruit fly. They haven't got blighted wow, by fruit fly. Terrific. So that's good because my black Russians have got fruit fly. Um, yeah. That is a red celery field here that you can see. I have no recollection of planting red celery at all. I think I probably just spilt a packet of stuff and that's what happened. <laughs> but that's what you're going to have tonight in your soup anyway. And <laughs> it's probably crossed with white celery. We've had young berries at the back that have been really good. This is, um, the, this is a butternut jack cross. I keep it there to illustrate permaculture principle number one, observe and interact, because that's what happens when you don't. <laughs> what happens when you're, when you're swanning around the country um, having permaculture fun in other people's gardens and you don't look after your own. <laughs> so yeah, if I'd been here, I, I would have noticed it and pulled the flower out. Um, yeah, but it's still edible. It's lasted maybe it's probably been there about 10 months and it's been a really good teacher of observe and interact so I'm going to keep it there. It's like a pumpkin sculpture. Yeah it is, yeah, yeah. Yeah we've had, we had maybe 80 kilos of pumpkins the first year, they took over the whole garden. Um, second year 60 kilos, last year not so many, I grew 300 kilos in Victoria which is probably more than necessary. <laughs> So yeah, if you have a surplus of something and you think, why did I plant so much? And it's good to try and find a, a reason for having it. So it justifies the fact that you've got too much of something. You can give stuff away. The seeds, this will make thousands and thousands of celery seeds that you can give away. Um, and the tops, I went to Green Patch for a couple of days and what they do there is they just pick the tops and they let them dry outside. And it's a concentrated celery flavor for soup. So rather than throw them out, it's really tasty. You know, I think most of us know how to use a few tops, but I didn't realise just how tasty it was and how easy it is just to put the whole lot in a tray and let it dry, rather than chuck it out. Yeah, yeah, just dry it. So um, you can see these little bees are very happy in there. We're going to split this hive and maybe give half, give the new one to. There's a local community garden up the road which has been made in a park. These are avocados that have produced like quite a lot of avocados but this year it looks like they dropped their crop they flowered profusely and seem to have dropped everything rain. too much rain not enough water I don't know it's I'm not going to take it personally <laughs> maybe yeah there's one hanging over the neighbor's house ah. out. Um, that's a custard apple that looks happy that was actually I went away for two months and came back and it was lying flat in its face covered in cherry tomatoes um, and I thought it was dead and it was like, you know, oh God, no, I can't look. I had to send my son up to see if it was still alive. But look, it's okay now. So if you do find one of your trees flatten its face covered in an abundance of something else, don't give up, it might survive. And a wonderful pomegranate there. I had a pomegranate out the front that just wasn't nice and I'm hoping that one will be, will live up to its name <laughs> of being wonderful. So um, my son is the pond builder here, um, so we've got striped marsh frogs and I think it's Lebanese land cress, is that what you, do you know Gordon? Le Lebanese something cress, it's edible but it, it does take over, good chook food. There was some Chinese celery in there but it got out competed and there are water chestnuts somewhere down the bottom so you can grow quite a lot of edibles in your pond and it's a little ecosystem. Do you add the frogs? Uh, we got some tadpoles from the community garden, but um, somehow or other they all died. My son cleaned out that pond and put the water back and all the frogs and all the tadpoles died, but they just found their way back there. We just saw frog spawn. Yeah. So if you provide the environment, things will come, which is really nice. It's a nice feeling. It make your, you've made your home welcome to animals. Um, we're trying to cover the chicken house there because it gets too hot in summer. Um, and rather than just with plastic, there's um, dragon fruit growing at the back and that seems to be taking off. Um, planted passion fruit, uh, grape 
and there's a honey merkut growing there so and another dragon fruit now, if anyone wants to take dragon fruit home you can just break a piece of that off in the chicken house and stick it in the ground it's a huge vine though it gets really big it'll fill up that whole chicken house <laughs> it might just be a dragon fruit house <laughs> um, there's a lemonade up the back there and i'm hoping to get two white sapotes which are my favorite fruit i just have to wait for the right kind that's a little black sapote there, it's been struggling. That'll, that's chocolate pudding fruit. Ah, and today I just noticed it's got little seeds, little fruit starting, and it looks like quite a lot of them too. So they're a fruit that are related to persimmon, um, and you eat them when they're soft and squishy and they look like they're ready to be thrown out. So a lot of people don't know what they are. And if you serve one up, people will ask you how you prepared it and how you cooked it. Because <laughs> it's all like chocolate mousse inside. It may be a bit disappointing, not as sweet. When you call something chocolate pudding fruit, you probably expect it to be sweeter than it, than it is. Have you had some fruit yet? I had one from that one, yeah. Oh, it's, even that small. Yeah, but it's only small. Um, did have fruit from the persimmon, and there's a few blueberries that happen now and again. I don't think blueberries are happy in this environment. I don't yeah, think they like the heat. No. no. Well, there is a, uh, it is a tropical blueberry you can buy, which is a hybrid. I want to get that. <laughs> yeah, so it's trial and error. If things yeah. don't work out, then give them away and get something and try that. Because um, you can't expect to have 100% success with food. And that's good for the chooks. Too. Yeah, comfrey. Comfrey's great for chickens composting and it just comes back like borage. There's a whole lot of baby borage coming up, so if you want some. Yeah, it just, it just comes. Tons of it growing around there. And locusts. Mostly. I, try, I like to eat vegetables more than fruit um, as a large part of the diet so you know ideally I wouldn't buy any green vegetables but I still do um, I don't have to it's the main thing especially with lots of herbs and there's lots of medicinal teas as well so usually if there's a bunch of students we'll have lemon verbena tea pineapple sage And at the moment you can see this is very dry and it's really time to do some soil improvement as well even though this is good composted green waste um, I need to actually let finish eating what's in there and do some soil improving that's pretty good soil but it's dry and it's a bit lifeless so um, yeah I need to let them go fallow for a bit I'm a bit reluctant to do that because I want to use every bit of space but that doesn't pay off if you keep doing it that's about it. Oh, little apple tree there that's in the wrong position. It's not going to do well, but that's the only space left. Um, and this persimmon had a 250 gram fruit on it. This, I think, yeah, summertime. It was huge and beautiful. And I watched it get ripe and watched it and then went away and came back and my daughter ate it. So um, I brought her up to have really good taste. <laughs> she always gets there first. What's She's, this stuff here? That's just a ground cover that's... Uh, no, not edible. Yeah, strawberries has been good. And that's an Isabella. There's an Isabella grapevine. Sorry, point out that. Isabella grapevine from Bulleye. A friend of mine had them and reckons they're really hardy and they don't get mould. I've had problems with these grapes. They seem to be getting caterpillars on them. But um, hopefully this pergola will be covered in four different types of grapes. Which will be nice, and if someone wants to do wine making, come over and let's do that. Why not? <laughs> Just eat grapes. Just get fed grapes. <laughs> Have dry them yet? Yeah. Oh, that's about it. That's all, folks.